Uh, what I'm going to show today goes pretty fast, so make sure that you pay careful attention lest you miss a lot of great simulation. So to get things started, we'll start with a model. It always starts with a model. And we believe we started with a mission uh, and a dream that simulation is really underutilized by designers for everything that was just talked about, especially concept exploration. It tends to be used for validation. And we said, how and what do we have to do in order to allow simulation to be used by every designer, every engineer? We decided we had to really radically change how simulation works. And here's what we did to illustrate. This model is a model of a thermal mixer. So it's a pipe where fluid might come in from one side, the other, and you want to mix those temperatures together. Now, in order to run simulation here, it's as simple as specifying that you want to do a fluid study and then selecting one or more inlets. So here you interactively select one inlet, maybe a second, and then an outlet on the far side. That's it. What you're now viewing here live, and again, a little bit hard to visualize, is a full 3D fluid simulation. Fluid is coming in from the two inlets, mixing and going downstream. Now, perhaps a better way to visualize it would be to look at a slice through this volume. So here, instead of looking at this three-dimensional display, we'll look at a 2D one for you to visualize what's going on. Now, the first thing we did is we said we had to make simulation very, very fast, which hopefully I just started to show to you, and I'll show you more. Second, we wanted to make simulation interactive. No more should we call the reviewing a display of results post-processing because it shouldn't happen as a post-step. It should happen during and while the solver is running, allowing you to visualize and understand what's going on inside your simulation. Now the third thing that we wanted to change and do very, very differently is to allow simulation to be interactive in terms of input. And what I mean is that here we visualize the simulation and we have a velocity from the left and the right. What would it be possible in terms of exploration if I could take one of these parameters and change them while the simulation runs? So here I've increased the inlet velocity from the top, you immediately see that this changes the mixing characteristic. If I'm a designer, I might want to target this flow to enter down here and not float across the top. Now I did mention a second ago that this is a thermal mixer. So let's go ahead and add a temperature to this. Again, I'm not going to stop the solver. Everything's running live, OK? And we'll go up here and add an additional condition. And I don't have to pick a different type of study, a different type of simulation. Let's say that we make this 100 degrees at the top. And now, rather than looking at velocity, what you're doing here is a velocity distribution. Let's look at temperature instead. Okay. And here, if I flip some of the controls and displays, this gives you a 3D understanding of how the fluid is mixing. And you'll see that it's actually doing a pretty good job. It comes in from the top. These veins that appear in the flow distribute the heat and the temperature downstream. But could we do a little bit better? So let's go back to this cross section for just one second. And again, while the simulation's running, we thought of one more thing that we really wanted to change to allow every designer to explore new concepts. And that was the geometry itself. So here, while the simulation runs, I can make a change. You'll notice it updates. Even though I changed literally the domain that we are simulating, the solver did not restart, but it continued from that change. And again, for fun, if I was exploring and optimizing a designer, I could make more drastic changes. I could do things like maybe adding a bit of a nozzle here, right? Something to connect these and bring them together. And again, as soon as I make these changes, immediately the flow will update. This is what we think is the power that every engineer needs to do interactive simulation and design. And of course, at any point if I want, I can restart and watch the simulation run. All right, let's look at another example. So I know perhaps you're thinking to yourself, is this is a fluids only simulation. And Justin, it probably only works for pipes. So let's look at something else. Here we have an assembly. So now we have a bunch of parts that come together. And we're going to look at thermal conduction. Here we have a heat sink that's being liquid cooled to a number of fins on the outside. 
you'll notice as fast as I can hit this solve, there's no pre-computation, no pre-analysis of results, just geometry, boundary conditions, and then a real-time simulation result. What we're viewing here is temperature distributed across this. Now, uh, another feature of the software is I believe it's very important to make decisions based on all the data that comes out of this real-time simulation. So here, let's add what we call a chart, and this is gonna plot our maximum temperature, which is a great indication for a heat sink of just how well we're doing at dissipating heat. So now as I plot this, you'll see a current temperature, I can start to make changes. I can look at what would happen if one of these tubes got blocked. Let's say, for example, that I want to remove this from the simulation. A click of a button, a recalculation of the result, and I can see as a designer just how much hotter it's gonna get. Not that much hotter. But I could continue to explore other questions. What would happen if I remove some of these fins? Do I need them, right? Are they important? Again, at a click of a button in this live interactive environment, I can delete them, watch the simulation update, and notice the effect on the performance. So let's push the limit even more. Let's say instead here, that we bring something larger. So we did a thermal simulation, small set of pipes. Well, let's take a larger model. This model has, I believe, about 28,212 faces. Uh, full engine block, right? All the detail, the internal cooling channels. Could we do the same thing that I just did on this? So we'll say we want to do a thermal study. Maybe for boundary conditions, we'll assign an amount of heat, right, that's being generated on these cylinders where the combustion is happening. Again, as a designer, this is simple. I don't have to understand time steps, convergence, et cetera. And we type an appropriate number, maybe 30 kilowatts. Even though this model has a great deal more complexity, we still get a real-time simulation. Now, to go just a little bit further again, let's add in the calculators I showed a moment ago. Let's take the max temperature on this cylinder on the right, and we'll take the max temperature on the cylinder on the left. All right, put this one over here. Now, let's make an addition, a change, and again, watch what happens during this change. Let's take the faces that appear in here, which is the cooling jacket, right? We're gonna have a lot of cooling fluid. Let's add a boundary condition to represent those. Maybe this is a convection, right? It's cooled by a liquid that's gonna pass through here at a certain rate, and we'll put in something like this. Again, this updates, and you'll see in real time, this right side comparatively is cooler. But maybe as a designer, I want to see all this speed, not just steady state final solutions. Maybe I actually want to look at things like the transient behavior. We can do that too. So here, when I run the simulation, you'll now see the heat pass through the part and how it heats up over time, how long it takes something to transfer heat, not just the final steady state temperature that it gets to. And again, I can do comparisons and contrast. But I've now shown thermal and we've shown fluids. Let's move on. Let's say, can we do structural physics? Structural physics is more difficult, right? We've got parts, and we need to handle strain energies and all kinds of good stuff. This is the type of part that I would argue is bread and butter for structural design. It has a good deal of complexity, nothing extreme, but as is typical of almost every CAD part, it's dirty. If I come and look down here at the bottom sections, you'll see sometimes there are edges that are slightly corrupt and weird. If I was a simulation analyst, I might look at things like faces that come to narrow regions or sharp curvature changes, and I might worry that those are gonna throw off my simulation. We believe that if we wanna make simulation usable by any design engineer, it needs to be as simple as pushing a button, selecting a physics, assigning boundary conditions, and getting an answer. And I think we can do that here. Let's say we do a structural simulation, we pick a material, we pick a few boundary conditions. Maybe a set of uh, connected regions here that we want to constrain, these holes. These will be mounting, they're now fixed. The only other thing maybe I'll do is to apply a force to this face right here. And I would ask you, there's a number of ribs that appear here, could any of you tell me, you know, in seconds, which rib is gonna be under the most stress when I apply this force? I couldn't, I couldn't have guessed, maybe. Uh, but you see, as a designer, whatever question you have in the world of design, questions are some of the most important things, right? What if is the most valuable question? But now we're making the answers to those questions extremely fast and extremely simple. And the other cool thing is that as simulation becomes this fast, we make uh, mistakes very, very cheap. So for example, if I missed a mounting hole as part of this simulation, it's as easy as adding a boundary condition during the simulation, after the simulation, or whatever you might like. 
And as I add that, we get an update, a very different result, and lo and behold, a different location for peak stress on those ribs. So we make mistakes cheap. So now moving on uh, to a final couple of examples. The last thing I want to highlight about the approach used here with Discovery Live is that we also make complexity free. And what I mean by that is if you have a model like this, something that has a good deal of geometric complexity, lattice elements that vary in size, shape, in no way is it uniform. Also, by the way, this happens to be something that's entirely faceted. So we could take data that's scanned or data that might come out of a mesh or other sources, and we can use it as the basis for simulation as well. So let's say we do a structural simulation here. We pick a material, maybe this is printed in aluminum, and we interactively select regions, even though this is a faceted model, and we'll hold those fixed. That's where this bracket would mount. And then we'll apply a force, we'll pull on it. You can apply a force anywhere in whatever direction you might like, but we'll do the following. And also, lastly, we'll pick a direction for this, something like that. Now, even though this has a great deal more complexity, you'll notice some thin regions up here, we start to get a solution. One of the things I can do is vary this fidelity, so at a click of a button, we'll turn it up, we well capture the overall geometry, and we still get a very, very fast solution. Complexity is cheap, complexity is free. Now, just to push it one last step, the last type of physics included here is the ability to run frequency studies, to look at the behavior of a part like this, and we'll just do free vibration, and to say in which ways is it weakest, at what resonant frequencies and what values is it going to resonate, and in what direction. For something like this, with this geometric complexity, this would be extremely expensive with classical methods. All right. Two very quick final examples. We believe that everyone should use simulation, even architects or people designing the layouts of buildings, right? Here I have set up a fluid simulation. We we'll have a number of buildings. At the click of a button, live, we can look at how the air might pass along these buildings to look at things like walkways, right? To evaluate where is the speed of the wind going to get up. And then, of course, as I keep mentioning, it's all about change to allow anyone doing this design to interact with their model and learn instantaneously. All right, lastly, I'll leave you with one model. So here's a larger version. Here's an assembly of a uh, military vehicle. And I chose this model for a very specific reason, okay? Not only does it have a number of details here, things like vents that anyone running traditional CFD simulation would remove from their model. We won't do that. But it's also very interesting when it comes to CFD because the cabin is open and connected to the rest of the flow. So is this something any designer should have to worry about when using CFD? I would argue no. Here it's running as simple as saying we want to run an external airflow simulation, pick a direction interactively, and pick a ground plane. After this, the simulation runs automatically. And again, here we can control the fidelity based on the speed that we want. So let's run it faster. Again, you'll see here with the real-time displays, a full interaction and rendering of what is going on through the domain. And lastly, just to push the limits, you could imagine doing something like taking the entire vehicle and putting another copy behind it. So hopefully with this, you've got an idea of how we are very excited and taking a different approach to simulation that is real-time, instantaneous, and unlocks the ability to explore. Thank you.